I think that we're fascinated with dinosaurs for the same reason that we invented or were fascinated with dragons. We've been finding these giant bones and we've been imagining what they were for as long as we've been human. I don't think it's a coincidence that, that lots of kids like dinosaurs, and I think it's because they're big and they're scary and formidable and strange and you know foreign to anything that we have today, but they're also very safely dead. This idea that the world belonged to a different kind of creature, a creature that's just so foreign to us, is both like intriguing and frightening and it just captures our, our imagination. Dinosaurs are a very accessible part of science. I sort of think of dinosaurs as kind of a, an entry point for science for kids or even, even adults in some cases. Some of us paleontologists jokingly call dinosaurs the gateway drug for science. Dinosaurs ruled the Earth for close to 165 million years. These fascinating creatures came in all shapes and sizes. And even though they are long since extinct, they capture the imagination of people both young and old to this very day. Fossils on display in a museum are not the only way we can experience dinosaurs, however. Dinosaurs have been shown on screen for nearly as long as the medium of film has existed. Why do we love seeing dinosaurs on screen? How has the portrayal of dinosaurs in film changed over time? And what overall impact have these creatures left on the medium of film? So to answer these questions, we need to go back to the very beginning. No, no, not that far back. We actually have to go back to the year 1915. Ladies and gentlemen, meet Gertie the dinosaur. Gertie, Gertie, come on out. Come on out and take a pretty bow. So Gertie the Dinosaur is just the first movie star. She went on tour with Windsor McKay and did tricks. It's the quintessential attraction of, of the early cinema. Is it's how, you, how we go from vaudeville theater to the movies. And I just don't think we can overstate the importance of that moment, of that achievement, was a dinosaur. Created by animator Windsor McKay, Gertie the Dinosaur was one of the earlier animated films. Not only was it groundbreaking as a piece of animation, but this vaudeville duo was also the first film to show animated and live action characters interacting with one another in real time. Gertie, to show how friendly she is, will let me ride her. Let me go get ready. Safe to say, it wowed audiences to see man interact with prehistoric beasts in this way. But soon enough, a new form of animation emerged, leading to even more lifelike dinosaurs on the silver screen. Enter stop motion, the process of ever so slightly manipulating the position of an object between frames to create the illusion of real-time movement. Dinosaur films flourished under this new art form, giving audiences all sorts of thrilling prehistoric adventures like 1925's The Lost World, which was actually the first feature-length film to use stop-motion as its primary special effect. The head of special effects for the film was this guy, Willis O'Brien, who was one of the earliest pioneers of stop-motion. O'Brien would work on another film in 1933 that would easily become his most iconic work. Aside from the titular ape, King Kong featured all sorts of fantastically crafted stop-motion dinosaurs. Also, O'Brien's use of layering, which allowed the human actors and stop-motion creatures to interact with each other, was masterful for its time. As someone who does stop-motion animation, I can tell you right away that feathers and fur, oh man, are those hard. Dinosaurs don't have that problem. Uh, rubber and plastic and uh, clay, you can really get the dinosaurs looking pretty much exactly how you want them to. So I think that's why as the form and the practice of stop motion developed with cinema, the filmmakers always come back to dinosaurs because they can make them just look so good. While stop motion was the go-to medium for early dinosaur films, there were a few exceptions. Meet the notorious Slurposaur, a trope that was popular in many dinosaur films pre-1960s. I would imagine the filmmakers thought general audiences of the time wouldn't care if their dinosaur was just an iguana wearing fake horns. And to be fair, they were probably right. 
But whether dinosaurs in these early films were stop-motion creatures or literal giant lizards, many paleontologists who have devoted their lives to studying dinosaurs look back on these portrayals and crack a smile. The early portrayals of dinosaurs in film and television and animation, you know, they are often portrayed as big, slow, sluggish, dim-witted, very lizard-like, very similar to modern reptiles like lizards and, and crocodiles, or at least people's perceptions of those animals. You know, nowadays we consider them to be much more, you know, active, dynamic, socially complex animals. You know, probably many of them were warm-blooded, many were feathered, you know, much more bird-like than was known for a long time. But that current understanding of dinosaurs didn't really come about until beginning in the 1970s. Now another famous aspect of these stop-motion dinosaur films was that they were creature features, portraying dinosaurs alongside humans. While this plot device was used for most of these movies since the very beginning, the dinosaur films of the 60s and 70s mostly showed dinosaurs and cavemen fighting for survival. Released in 1966 by Hammer Films, One Million Years BC is one of the most well-known of these dinosaurs versus cavemen films. You know, some of that stuff probably contributes to the widespread conception that cavemen lived alongside dinosaurs. It definitely wasn't doing science a service um, by having cave Raquel Welch, you know, interacting with these with these creatures. Um, you still get plenty of people today, you know, here in 2023 that are surprised when you tell them, you know, the last what we call non-avian dinosaur died out 66 million years ago. And the oldest thing that some scientists would call Homo sapiens is about 300,000 years old. But again, you know, these are not documentaries that were meant to entertain, and I think probably many of the people making them knew that they were bending the, the scientific rules quite dramatically and making these things for the sake of a you know, better plot or more entertaining movie or something like that. The head of special effects for One Million Years BC was Ray Harryhausen, another stop-motion legend who is probably most well-known for fantasy flicks like Clash of the Titans. Harryhausen's next famous dinosaur outing was 1969's The Valley of Guanji, the world's first dinosaur western. And yes, it's just as cool as it sounds. By the 1980s, our scientific understanding of dinosaurs and the capabilities of stop motion had increased tenfold. Meet Phil Tippett, who is another big name in the world of stop motion and special effects. Tippett worked on arguably the most iconic series of science fiction films ever made designing and animating various characters for the Star Wars saga. In 1984, he created the 10-minute short film Prehistoric Beast. A year later, Tippett worked on the documentary special Dinosaur. The CBS documentary was groundbreaking because it was one of the first instances to really show dinosaurs as animals instead of monsters. In 1993, however, all the work put in by both animators and paleontologists culminated into what many believe is the greatest dinosaur movie ever made. Whenever we watch really everything pre-late 80s, early 90s, they never look like they're quite with the dinosaurs. We really want to believe they're there and it works. When we're welcomed to Jurassic Park and the, the music comes up and we see the sauropods just looming over the characters and stomping and we hear the sound, that's where the believability of that is just there compared to where it was. It was revolutionary in depicting dinosaurs for virtually the first time as the active animals that we know them to be today. In fact, it probably went too far in many cases. Um, you know, Velociraptor wasn't as smart as a chimpanzee. Um, it probably couldn't open doors. They definitely couldn't run 60 miles an hour. T-Rex, probably not chasing down Jeeps, but all in all, it was an absolutely revolutionary piece of film, both for the groundbreaking technological achievements in it with computer animation, but from a scientific standpoint, again, the public's first entree, I guess, into the idea that dinosaurs were as active as modern birds, as modern mammals, I think had a massive effect on changing public conceptions of dinosaurs. So what makes Jurassic Park look so good, even by today's standards, was its use of both CGI animation and practical animatronic effects. Well, believe it or not, director Steven Spielberg originally planned to use stop motion by our good friend Phil Tippett to bring Jurassic Park's dinosaurs to life. However, the team at the film's special effects company, Industrial Light and Magic, had been experimenting behind the scenes with creating the first ever computer animated dinosaur. After various iterations and tests, they showed the footage to Spielberg and the film's producers who were blown away and the decision to use CGI animation for Jurassic Park was made. But where did this leave Phil Tippett? 
We're out of a job. Don't you mean extinct? What would have been one of Tippett's biggest gigs was officially dead. However, Spielberg did at least decide to keep him around on set as a consultant, because he knew that Tippett's knowledge of the dinosaur's movements would be a huge help to the animators. As for modern dinosaur movies, there have been some notable ones released since Jurassic Park, but nothing has come close to achieving that film's cultural impact. Some of the more recent dinosaur films, like the Jurassic World franchise, or 65, have been less than stellar, to put it lightly. Who knows? Maybe Hollywood dinosaur movies peaked with Jurassic Park, and it's only downhill from here. But there is a different kind of dinosaur film that seems like it's only been getting better and better over time. The Dinosaur Documentary. I think the, the sort of primo example of, you know, of a modern dinosaur documentary is the Prehistoric Planet series that's recently been on Apple TV. You know, those shows, they, they really are trying to imagine you've taken a time machine and are watching T-Rex interact in its environment or watching titanosaurs stomp through Patagonia. Depictions of dinosaurs in documentaries have increasingly aligned with scientific understanding, even to the point now where new documentaries are incorporating discoveries that happened literally like a year or two before the documentary came out. New scientific discoveries give us opportunities for new storytelling. I'm fascinated by the idea that paleontology has evolved from digging up bones to making educated hypotheses about behavior. There are so many ways that we can experience the thrills and wonders of dinosaurs, but there is actually a way that we can see real dinosaurs living alongside us today and it might just surprise you. Birds are descended from dinosaurs. Birds are a type of dinosaur. Every single one of the 11,000 species of birds that fly, walk, swim around us today are all ultimately descended from a small feathered dinosaur that would have looked something like a velociraptor. People debated the origin of birds for decades, literally decades, more than a century. Then in 1996, a farmer in northeastern China dug up a dinosaur with feathers on it. And for almost everybody, that was the last piece of evidence that sealed the deal that every single bird that you see flying around you today is descended from a theropod dinosaur. We have 500 different birds here at the National Aviary um, from every continent except for Antarctica. We have in the past done a living dinosaur theme here at the National Aviary. It's hard to not look at the raptors in particular, a hawk, an eagle, a falcon, whatever it is, and not see a dinosaur. When a lot of these birds are hunting or foraging, I think you would see a lot of dinosaur-like behaviors. So where do dinosaur films go from here? Well, I believe that dinosaurs will always have a place on screen, because they really are the greatest movie monsters that actually existed. Special effects to bring these prehistoric beasts to life will continue to evolve, and so will our scientific understanding of them. And whether we see dinosaurs through a work of movie magic, an exhibit in a museum, or as a little bird flying by, I believe that they will always capture our imagination and continue to inspire us.